Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Xavier Salomon. I'm the Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick Collection. Uh, the exhibition, The Pursuit of Immortality, Masterpieces from the Sher Collection of Portrait Medals, celebrates the substantial gift of medals from the collection of Stephen Kay and Janie Wu Sher to the Frick Collection. This is one of the most significant gifts to the museum since it was founded in 1919. It is a gift that perfectly complements the collection here of paintings and sculpture. To accompany the exhibition, it is therefore an immense pleasure for me to introduce a colleague and friend, Professor Lauren Jacoby, from the Department of Architecture of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She has been Assistant Professor of Architectural History at MIT since 2013, after a very impressive teaching career in New York City, at Marymount Manhattan College, at Brooklyn College, and in the Art History Department at New York University, and subsequently also in the Department of Art History at Dartmouth College. Professor Jacoby and I first met in 2001, studying for our MA in Art and Architectural History at the Cortal Institute of Art in London, where she wrote a brilliant thesis on the medals of Pope Paul V connected to architectural commissions, which was later published as an article in 2002 in the journal The Medal. I have followed Professor Jacobi's career over the years as a fellow art historian and as a close friend for now more than 15 years. Her experience in London was followed by a PhD in architectural history at the Institute of Fine Arts here in New York, where she completed a thesis on the topography of banks in Rome in the early modern period. She has published widely on a number of subjects, from architectural history to the history and role of banking and money. She has reviewed exhibitions in art historical magazines, such as Tabula Quarterly and the Burlington Magazine. She has also been awarded a number of notable fellowships and awards. In 2009, she was at the Istituto Olandese di Storia dell'Arte in Florence. Between 2011 and 2012, she held a Thor Fellowship at the Drawing Institute at the Morgan Library and Museum. And most recently, between 2015 and 16, she won the Rome Prize in Renaissance and Early Modern Studies at the American Academy in Rome. Professor Jacobi has lectured widely on medals, but also on banking buildings in the Renaissance, on metal and mints, and on the economic geography of Italy and Europe. She is currently working on a book which will study the historical relationship between financial institutions and religious behavior, exploring urbanism and architectural forms that will reveal attitudes towards money and ta at the time when capitalism was born in Europe. Her work has often focused on the intersection between architecture and economics. She is therefore the perfect person to explore a specific and fascinating aspect of medallic history, that is the transfer of medals to a large scale ornament in architectural buildings. Medals may be small, portable objects, but as we will see, they're part of a much more important and broader set of ideas in Renaissance Europe. Following the lecture, the exhibition will remain open in the galleries downstairs until 7.30, and you will be able to, to view the exhibition. And I would like to take this opportunity also to thank the Robert H. Smith Family Foundation for their support of both the exhibition in general and tonight's lecture, together with other programming for this exhibition. Professor Jacobi's lecture will be streamed live on our website tonight, and it will be available for later viewing also online. I would like to ask you at this time to please turn off all cell phones. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lauren Jacobi. So before I begin my uh, talk this evening, I'd like to begin by thanking you, Xavier, very much for that kind introduction, uh, and then also for uh, the invitation to give this talk. Uh, Amy Young, uh, Adrian Lay, and Eloise Owens um, also deserve thanks for helping me as I prepared for uh, tonight's uh, discussion, tonight's talk. Um, and so as Xavier mentioned, uh, my talk title is Renaissance Medals as Ornament. So in 1962, conservators set about cleaning the central door of Rome's major basilica church, St. Peter's. As conservators removed layers of dirt, recalcitrant matter out of place, 
accretions marking, mark, marking the passage of time. They found that an object resembling a small portrait metal, measuring 59 millimeters in width, had been cast into the middle of the bottom rail of the left door. Held by mythical hooved uh, centaurs, the depiction is of a man shown in profile. Cherubs present a similar object in the equivalent place on the right door. A punched inscription identifies the sitter of what is either a metal or a quasi-metal, as Antonio Filarete, who would receive fame for writing a treatise on architecture and who is the figure responsible for designing the door. The depiction and the inscribed roundel conform to an 18th century account of the door in which the author noted that, quote, he who had them, that is the doors, made, and he who made them could be known through their names and portraits, referring to Pope Eugenius IV, the patron, who can be seen in the middle panel of the door on the right side, and also Filarete. Filarete uh, it was not alone in using metal-like objects to assert authorial claims and status. Scholars recently have recognized that Baccio Bandinelli included his portrait in a small roundel on the left pier of a bronze panel of the Lamentation of Christ and a plaster version of it. The roundel is, ca is a cast metal that Bandinelli commissioned from Leone Leone uh, once uh, Bandinelli had been knighted. With its profile delineation uh, based on a self portrait drawn by Bandinelli, the medal was made after 1529 when Charles V bequeathed Bandinelli uh, with the coveted cross of Santiago. Given that inhabitants of the medieval, uh, of medieval and Renaissance world, um, that the inhabitants, of, excuse me, of the European um, medieval and Renaissance world associated wonder with things that were large in scale. For example, the wonders of the ancient world, which were uh, designated as themata, or sites. It is curious that both Filarete and Bandinelli deliberately opted to remind viewers of their presence through objects inherently small in scale. Wonder in Latin literature is uh, characterized often as something that is complex, that has boundless variety, that is significantly uh, big. Um, and I should say that uh, the uh, images in, in this slide are some of the medals that can be found downstairs in the uh, exhibition. So if wonder was not induced in metals in the sense of uh, the sublime, it perhaps was evoked in objects like Filarete's metal in the mode that Caroline Walker Bynum identified in the contrast between admiratio, recoiling or backing up in wonder, perhaps at the gigantic, as opposed to imitatio, that is moving forward to study, to inspect, uh, to apprehend. As others have noted, particularly uh, Paul Binsky, smallness might not denote majesty and magnificence, but it accords with the uncanny, the aesthetics of the intimate, uh, which stimulate a particular form of enthrallment with smallness. In the words of Gaston Bachelard, quote, the minuscule and narrow gate opens up an entire world. The details of a thing can be a sign of a new world, which like all worlds contain the attributes of greatness. Miniature is one of the uh, refuges of greatness, end of quote. With its origin in the elite environments of the Italian uh, courts, the Renaissance medal is a fully humanistic endeavor, which united an intense study of the past with an interest in promoting individual fame. Due to their smallness and the fact that they were reproduced serially, uh, portrait medals were easily exchangeable, and they were among, among the most prized items collected. The size of metals uh, it was and also is key to their appeal, and it enabled their easy circulation. As is well known, metals like uh, prints and coins, could, uh, uh, coins um, uh, 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 were disseminated to a very wide audience. Until the second half of the 16th century, they usually were cast, um, although there were exceptions, meant mimetically to evoke uh, classical antique coins. During the Renaissance, med medals uh, were often distributed broadly and sent to, uh, to send a calculated message about one's public persona and to commemorate achievements. Medals circulated amongst networks of friends. They were used to solicit marriage. Uh, they were placed in buildings as a means of commemoration and as uh, apotropaic devices, a topic that I will return to later. As Stephen Schur has written, a medal, quote, commemorates, memorializes, glorifies, criticizes, or even satirizes its subject. 
When not stored, uh, often in purpose-built cabinets, medals were held, turned over in the hand, and talked about. Extending uh, our understanding of medals and their import, this evening I will discuss several examples of how medals were deployed in context aside from when they served as the coveted, uh, as coveted objects that were collected. I will present my talk uh, this evening uh, in six sections, which each uh, focus on an instance in which metals or numismatic imagery were magnified. First, however, uh, it should be acknowledged that metal migration took many uh, different forms. As occurred with uh, Filarete's doors and Bandinelli's lamentation scene, metals or their cast were instituted into artworks, perhaps evoking a long practice of setting coins from historically remote periods into objects, um, as we see here in a drinking bowl from the late 15th century, set with a coin of Alexander the Great, surrounded by 25 Roman denarii from the consular period which was given by the Danubian Literary Society. It was given to the Danubian Literary Society by the Chancellor of the Kingdom of Hungary. Likewise, uh, there is a vibrant and probably related tradition of setting medals or cast of them into book bindings. For example, the presentation copy given to Sixtus IV of a Latin version of Dio uh, Chrysotamus, um, uh, composed by Andrea Brenta, has an impression taken from a matrix of the obverse of Sixtus's medal celebrating a bridge, the Ponte Sisto, um, that was realized in Rome <clears throat> during Sixtus's papacy. From the standpoint of um, shifts in iconographic content. It is well known that uh, an image on a medal could be derived from depictions in other media. Francesco Di Giorgio's medallic depiction of Federico da Montefeltro was taken from Federico's portrait uh, in Piero della Francesca's Madonna with Child and Saints, known as the, uh, known as the Paola Montefeltro, uh, now at the Brera. Such miniaturizations often involved a process of shrinkage in which um, a representation was reduced in size without a metamorphosis in intrinsic appearance or proportions uh, and often without a change in meaning. But I'm not as much interested in those topics uh, as I am in shifts of scale in which the metal and related objects were magnified. As significant as pictorial representation was as a source for imagery on metals, I will focus tonight on what perhaps could be considered to be an inverse move in which the miniature was made to be large or even gigantic. In other words, situations in which the metal was scaled up. Representations of metals were transposed onto other media at a scale that was more expansive than the original object. And it is this group of objects that I will uh, focus on tonight. From a scalar perspective, uh, these macro images functioned as interfaces that allowed the small to be publicized, enabling it to be seen through a telescope, as it were. Uh, because the practice was tied to a Renaissance understanding of metals as objects intimately related to antique coins and uh, engraved stones, our discussion will include examples of instances in which those objects uh, were also represented at a, a large scale. So, uh, coins and metals, ontological difference. Um, it was Pisanello who popularized the format of the portrait medal that would become uh, the reigning standard, a likeness of the sitter, often in profile, an emulation of ancient coins on the reverse, with an often obtuse emblem, later to be called an impreze, um, of the sitter, and an appropriate model. And turning to issues of scale, it is worth pausing, though, to consider the origins of metals in the years before Pisanello set about casting them in the 1430s, instigating, instigating a vogue uh, for producing and collecting them. Those who study metals often look to Petrarch as a figure in the constellation of patrons, artists, and scholars who were implicated in the uh, origin of, the, uh, of early modern metals. One of uh, Petrarch's uh, patrons and close acquaintances um, was Francesco I da Carrara, master of Treviso and Padua. It is possible that Petrarch cultivated an interest in antique coins and gems in Francesco and his son, uh, who became Lord of Padua after his father renounced uh, his lordship. At the time, uh, John Galeazzo Visconti held the town along with much of the valley of the Po, Two years later, in 1390, the younger Francesco recaptured Padua in a surprise attack. 
To celebrate victory, Francesco had medals struck in emulation of Roman sestere, with obverse images of both men in the guise of Roman emperors. The medals were likely produced at the Pagan Mint. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, medals or imitations uh, of Roman coins were made in the 1390s by two members of the Venetian Sesto family, Marco and Lorenzo, who each worked at the Venetian Mint. Marco's struck medal bears a portrait of the Roman Emperor Galba, uh, based on an antique precedent, like the coin shown in the bottom slide. Um, an allegorical figure of Venice, one of the first uh, of such representations, is depicted on the medal's uh, reverse. The size of sestere produced at imperial mints under Galba varies. A brief survey of Galba's sestere in the collection of the American Numismatic Society uh, reveals the coins range from roughly 33 to 36 millimeters. Galba's coin on display downstairs in the pursuit of immortality is uh, slightly larger still. Yet, although the size of the antique coins shifts from example to example due to the affordance of the flans of metal used to make coins, they are approximate in size to what are often taken to be the first Renaissance medals, indicating that those who produced metals were keen to promote a mimetic uh, connection between coin and metal. Soon thereafter, however, Um, soon thereafter, however, metals that were relatively much larger than most ancient coins began to be produced. Among the most important prototypes for the portrait metal are objects that were in the collection of the Valois prince Jean de France, Duke of Berry, including two medals of Constantine the Great and Her Heraclius, um, Emperor of Byzantium. These objects have a complex history and a debated authorship. The Duke's inventories, uh, published in 1896, reveal that he possessed several uh, round gold objects now lost with persons, including Roman and Byzantine rulers, or scenes in relief, and which were uh, mounted in jeweled frames. Until the 17th century, collectors and others thought, um, of them, thought of them as genuine objects from antiquity, although scholarship has shown that the objects were most likely forged. A later uh, inventory reveals that the Duke had one copy made in gold of each of the Constantine and Heraclius pieces at some point between 1402 and 1413. We do not know if the resulting objects, copies of which are shown on the slide, uh, were at all similar to the forgeries. What is noteworthy, though, is the size of the pieces. And I should pause to say here that uh, when I created this slide, I was struck by the irony of um, talking about scale and using images <laughs> which are blown up, of course, in PowerPoint on the screen, hence uh, introducing um, a scale. <laughs> so uh, while conceptually related to ancient coins, the sheer girth of the metal suggests that while small compared to many other art forms, they deliberately were meant to be conceived as something slightly other than coins, um, especially contemporary coins. The distinction uh, is significant as it reveals anxieties both about money and about what kind of imagery is appropriate for metals as opposed to coins. Due to the economic function of coins, which were meant to create equivalences and to circulate, and certainly not to be hoarded, uh, it was critical to indicate that metals were ontologically something other than coins, and one such way uh, to do this was uh, to demonstrate it through scale. So Verona, uh, mediating authority. Um, the production of early metals coincides with the transfer of numismatic imagery onto architectural settings. Aside from denoting a general enthusiasm for the antique, um, the large-scale numismatic ornamentation suggests that patrons were keen to be associated with ancient rule. More specifically, material depictions of coins and metals were a physical analog for the less readily uh, visualized power wielded by the patron. Numismatic imagery mediated the relationship between an authority and those who recognized uh, that authority. What is also significant uh, in, uh, is that in examples that range from the 14th to the 15th century, denizens of the Renaissance were not necessarily bothered by asserting knowledge of either an exacting numismatic chronology nor having an actual ancient prototype that served as a model in these transferences. 
Um, in other words, um, it was not important to replicate the antique literally in the process of translatio that occurred as the iconography and inscriptions of coins and metals were scaled up and used as ornament. Uh, various examples underscore the point. Um, the, uh, let's see. Uh, the transformation of the micro to the macro is found in images that once graced the loggia of Palazzo degli Scalieri in Verona. Uh, the frescoes were commissioned by Altier, Altichiero uh, da Zevio, uh, by Cansignorio da La Scala, after he chose to modernize the building in uh, 1360, uh, 1364 and decorate the Sala Grande, uh, the big room uh, that was subsequently destroyed, with figures from the Flavian di dynasty. Uh, why Scalieri opted to have the Flavians depicted remains somewhat of an open question. Um, it could be due to their association with the town of Verona. And I should say that um, what you're looking at is, um, it's a bit of a hard image to put together, but in essence, um, there is a, a part of the uh, loggia which was on the second floor, so represented in the black and white image on the left-hand side of the screen. And so the images that you're seeing, the uh, ones that are on the right-hand side of the screen are in those arches, so the ones that are up above the image uh, down below. So a loggia adjacent to the Sala Grande had a series of grisaille paintings um, of Roman emperors set in quatrefoil uh, frames. All of the depictions were based on portraits from ancient coins. Four Roman emperors were depicted on each of the under arches. So here you see some of them. Um, Curiously, though, depictions of female figures interrupted um, a linear chronology. For example, between Elagabalus and the last of the Severans who ruled after him, uh, Severus Alexander, there was a representation of uh, Faustina uh, the Elder, who lived a century earlier. Um, first published systematically, uh, the first published uh, systematic classification of Roman coins is in Nia Vico's discourse on the uh, ancients. Um, however, well before that, manuscripts were illuminated with portraits derived from coins of famous Romans. Others have suggested that a text possibly was the inspiration for the use of numismatic imagery on the palazzo. Uh, during Can Grande della Scala's lifetime, a scribe penned a volume that conveyed the biographies of Roman emperors and medieval kings from Julius Caesar through Charlemagne, two copies of which were illustrated with uh, Roman coins. Regardless, though, of its origination, the images on the palace pictorialized and announced qualities the family saw in itself or wanted to have others envision about it. They were a way of managing and curating their self-image, as it were. So Bergamo and Pavia, heterogeneous uh, montage. Two uh, revealing examples um, of coins and metals being scaled up are found in northern Italy. One is on Bartolomeo Colleone's funeral chapel in Bergamo, commissioned by him uh, from uh, Giovanni Antonio Amadeo. The second is Amadeo's work at the Tritosa in Pavia. In each case, what emerges is a dynamic in which metals and coins were thought of relationally to history through architectural ornamentation. In considering the numismatic imagery on the Colleone Chapel and on the Tritosa, it is important to keep in mind that the word used for metals and coins, medallie, indicated both types of objects, blurring the lines of the antique and the contemporary. While I made the point a few moments ago that metals and coins ontologically were distinct in some ways, conceptions of them overlapped in a double logic that was actually not contradictory. Renaissance inventories uh, indicate how polyvalent the term was. A medallia could uh, mean either a metal or a coin. The objects were conflated linguistically. Early modern inventories lumped together metals of different size, artist, uh, and sometimes types of metals along with uh, coins. The inventory of Cardinal Francesco and Gonzaga's possessions taken uh, after his death indicate that he had 414 medallie in a chest, 47 gold ones in a silver clock case, 281 silver ones in a wooden box, 11 such objects, perhaps uh, lead or bronze in a paper bag or folder, and what were probably metals in a damas bag, alongside another sack that contained what were probably metals. Metals that were scaled up uh, to create ornament intimately were tied to practices in which ancient coins and metals were considered by inhabitants of the Renaissance world as like objects, furthering the fascination with antiquity that was so pervasive. 
One finds a blurring of such categories, um, coin and metal, at the Colleoni Chapel in Bergamo, pictured on the screen, along with the obverse of a portrait medal of the man who uh, commissioned it, Bartolomeo. Uh, the Certosa provided, uh, excuse me, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the chapel provided uh, an architectural mise-en-scene for an incredible variety of ornament. Um, one of the most impressive buildings to deploy all antique decoration that referenced coinage and sculpture from the ancient world, it was begun in 1472 and then finished four years later. The Colleone Chapel's variegated capitals and columns, the unorthodox use of a balustrade as a frieze supporting a columned arcade, and its ornamented pilasters are only some of the lavish elements that make the building a celebration of the intimate. Um, as uh, Andrew Burnett and Richard S uh, Schofield have noted, the facade displays motifs taken from small antique objects in northern Italy or that were, uh, were available uh, through uh, drawings. Although specific sources are impossible to pin down, the vibrant Bucrania, uh, dolphins, griffins, ram's heads, sphinxes, uh, uh, spiral columns, swags, and vases with flutes, uh, leaves, uh, stridulation, and spirals derive from ancient sources, and these are often funerary objects. The Colleone Chapel's uh, facade is the first sacred building in Lombardy to bear figural depictions based on ancient coins. The four pilasters that grace the facade each have a number of tondi of, of, with sculptures of celebrated Romans, alternating with a total of 12 lozenge um, shapes depicting uh, male saints, who were probably apostles. Depictions on the pilasters Uh, depictions on the uh, plasters on the left side of the building um, uh, bear images and include images of Diva Faustina and also Tullius Hostilius. On the lowest register of the building, uh, portraits of Nero, Galba, and Hadrian can be found among other uh, Roman emperors. The authenticity of the images with respect to antique coinage ranges, whereas Nero's profile and inscription are derived directly from coins. Galba and Hadrian's portraits are based on coins, but the inscriptions in the roundels are not antique. For Diva Faustina, the opposite occurred. The inscriptions are antique, but the imagery is either not based on coins or it is highly abstracted. The image in the inscription of the Tullus Hostilius appears to be invented with great liberties taken. The image in the inscription, um, excuse me, um, I will return to the implications of this mismatched uh, and co mismatching and commingling shortly. Um, however, begun uh, slightly uh, later than the Colleone Chapel, the Certosa of Pavia was meant to be home to the tombs of the Visconti Dukes of Milan. Its elaborate facade was initiated in the mid 1470s by uh, Amadeo and others, but it was left incomplete in the middle of the 16th century. The Certosa has a number of stone medallions um, with profile heads of figures from antiquity, all of which are situated underneath scenes from the New Testament. Some uh, of these were installed as early as uh, 1480 and others finished in the 1490s under the patronage of Ludovico il Moro. As Burnett and Schofield have suggested, the program in all likelihood was meant to demonstrate that the ancient world served as a building block upon which the New Testament was air. Uh, here are some of the uh, 61 roundels, um, read uh, in the slide from left to right uh, and then top to bottom. They depict uh, legendary Romans, uh, both emperors like Titus and Hadrian. Um, there are also monarchs, um, who are shown from uh, Babylonia and Persian kings and figures such as Attila, uh, mythological heroes too. Um, here's uh, a set that includes Hercules, um, who is shown uh, in the middle row um, on the uh, far left. Let's see if I can, so over here. Um, and then double portraits such as those of Romulus and Remus on the lower registers um, of the uh, left slide. Um, and so Romulus and Remus are shown down at the bottom over here. Um, there are also then scenes uh, from the reverses of antique coins, uh, and those are shown uh, here also on the left uh, over here. Uh, and then uh, here are the final six portraits on the right side of the Certosa. 
So as Bernadette and Schofield have explored, several aspects of the portraits were taken from Roman and Greek uh, coins and Renaissance medals. Uh, they grouped the portraits into several categories. First, medallions, um, uh, uh, in which the portrait relates explicitly to the representation on coins or medals, um, of which there are 10 examples, including this medallion of uh, Claudius. And second, um, the portrait of Octavian, which is a good example of the five roundels, wherein the portraits were derived from numismatic prototypes, but in which the inscriptions are deliberately inaccurate uh, and third are examples, uh, including a roundel of uh, uh, Judas, in which the head was copied from a coin um, or um, a medal, but then was misidentified. And finally, uh, there are portraits that were either uh, invented uh, or else that have not yet been traced to coins or medals, like the depiction of Pompey. So uh, several uh, uh, images um, appear to have been derived uh, from medals of drawings um, or actual medals. Uh, the head of Caracalla appears to have been taken from a medal produced in 1466, attributed to Giovanni Baldu. Uh, the reverse of Baldu's medal also provided inspiration for an adjacent roundel. Uh, an image of Constantine uh, was uh, taken from the previously discussed French medal of him. A different portrait of the uh, same emperor, so also Constantine, was gleaned from the French medal that depicts uh, Heraclius, uh, metamorphosized uh, into the famous Roman emperor. So there are several striking, striking aspects about uh, this series of roundels. One wonders if when metals were used as a source, it was because they were mistaken for ancient objects. Um, of the source metals uh, that were then esteemed enough on their own accord, or excuse me, or if the source metals were esteemed enough on their own accord to be magnified. Perhaps more interestingly though, the sculptors are those who inset the roundels appear to have grouped the objects according to type. So for example, Roman Empire, Persian King, kind of et cetera. Uh, but then they ignored uh, the internal chronology of that group, even though successions were known through sources such as Suetonius or the Historia Augustus. Accurate lineages were depicted, were depicted through coins in contemporaneous books, um, although those texts appear not to have been accessible at Pavia nor uh, in uh, ducal libraries. So tracing a precise lineage appears not to have been as important as generically referencing the past. In other words, the large-scale representations of coins and metals seem not to have been valued because they designated a singular uh, moment in time that could be ordered chronologically, but rather because they re referenced a distant world, however old. The roundels made explicit a sense of uh, collapsing time that is pulling the past uh, into the present. So Florence, uh, Palazzo Medici, an ornament. In his biography of the life of Donatello, Giorgio Vasari reported that, quote, in Palazzo Medici, in the first courtyard, there are eight marble tondi, where there are portraits from antique cameos and reverses of medallie, and very beautiful stories made by him, that is Donatello, uh, which are placed in the frieze between the windows and the architraves above the arches of the loggia. Uh, scholars uh, now tend uh, to, uh, to agree that Donatello wasn't responsible for the tondi. Uh, yet, as Vasari's 19th century translator, Gatano Melanese, noted, it is not difficult to find glyptics and hard stones with subjects like those depicted in the roundels. In one of the initial texts written on the tondi, um, Aldo uh, Ferrati addressed that aspect of their iconography, uh, which other scholars have expanded on. Scholars have a, uh, a connected a figural imagery uh, in the roundels to seven ancient gems um, and hard stones, and in one instance, a, a sarcophagus uh, relief. It has also been argued that with one exception, the subject of the objects was not known contemporaneously, and that the tondi show stylized images, indicating that they are sometimes uh, more refined than their prototypes. Thus, license uh, was taken uh, in approach to the antique. Knowledge about uh, gems on which the tondi uh, were based might have been indirect, um, the product of drawings or casts um, or even plaquettes. The roundel uh, with uh, Diomedes and the captured uh, palladium um, can be connected to a famous hard stone known through similar casts that was engraved um, with uh, the same scene. 
Uh, the gem depicts the Greek hero after he descended to an altar and uh, with a captured guardian image of Troy in his left hand, uh, which is raised uh, to display the trophy. The gem was renowned even before it entered, entered Lorenzo de' Medici's collections. Ghiberti, Lorenzo Ghiberti, described it as, quote, the most perfect thing I ever saw. A humanist had noticed the stone hanging around the neck of a young child and purchased it from uh, the child's father. It was later acquired uh, by a cardinal and then brought uh, by him, uh, brought, excuse me, from him by Pope Paul II, and then later um, acquired by Lorenzo. It was valued at 1,500 florins and kept by Lorenzo in the scrittoio of Palazzo Medici, as uh, is documented in the 1492 inventory um, and in the copy of that inventory that was later produced uh, in the 1500s. Um, this particular gem uh, was so beloved by Piero, Lorenzo's son, that when he fled Florence following the entrance of Charles VIII, he carried it with him, um, as well as his tapestries and a couple of other precious stones, two other ones. Um, well, while medieval and Renaissance inhabitants did not explicitly dismiss the minor arts, there were distinctions between the major and the minor that predated Giorgio Vasari's fixed hierarchy of painting, sculpture, and architecture as more elevated than other technical uh, artistic practices. Considering the uh, ornamental roundels in the cortile of Palazzo Medici enables us to better understand and apprehend the visual mechanisms through which the so-called minor was esteemed. The social anthropologist um, Alfred Gell has uh, advanced a concept that he terms the technology of enchantment, which he described as, quote, the power that technical processes have of casting a spell over us so that we see the real world uh, in enchanted form. Elsewhere, he argues, quote, it is the way an art object is constructed as having come into the world, which is the source of the power such objects have over us. They're becoming rather than their being. While Gell analyzes the potency of making, he also homes in on how processes were laden with meaning, including the process of comprehending um, an art object. His uh, concept is useful here in that the type of continual referencing small objects uh, make enchant uh, the architectural ornament and uh, ornamentation um, of the courtyard of Palazzo Medici and many other buildings. Gell is also attuned to, quote, the adhesive qualities of surface decoration, or what he calls the tackiness of ornament, wherein gaze sticks to ornament, which can be a liability, but also an instrument that binds and mediates social life. In this uh, sense, adhesion animates the courtyard uh, with its uh, variety of ornamental uh, media, including the sgraffito treatment of the facade, uh, Michelozzo's uh, Pietra Serena architecture, and the roundels. Extending this idea, the roundels and their subject matter uh, instantiate a dynamic in which Lorenzo de' Medici and his clan became known through small objects celebrated for their collection value. In a sense, a coveted collection was put on exhibit, put on exhibition, with the gaze of those who enter the courtyard stuck to ornament. Another way of framing this is that ornament is a relational device that differentiates and associates things and people frequently marking social status by signaling affiliations and also distinctions. In other words, ornament orders. Making the small, large, further that uh, ordering, I would argue, uh, as the Tandi demonstrate. So, um, images of images, Verona. Turning to an early example of the transposition of imagery, uh, from metal to wall in the Guantieri Chapel in the Church of Santa Maria della Scala in Verona, painted uh, depictions of metals raise a question. What happens when image makers as well as patrons start to become images themselves, as well as what happens when portraiture enters the realm of easy replication, which happened with the introduction of portrait metals and also later prints? Uh, dedicated to the life of St. Jerome, the chapel was commissioned for the burial site of Paolo Filippo Guantieri, who served as Podesta in Florence, where he met his demise uh, in uh, 1430. In a testament, Paolo had dedicated a yearly allotment to fund the decoration of a chapel in Santa Maria della Scala, and the Paduan uh, sculptor Bartolomeo da Carelli was at work on a tomb for it by 1432. 
Following the death of Paolo's wife uh, in uh, 1443, excuse me, 1443, um, a group of elite uh, Paduans commissioned Giovanni da Badile to fresco the chapel, a project that was probably completed by May of 1444. The Paduans hired the uh, Veronese artist Badile um, to uh, fresco the chapel. The cycle he created includes four representations derived from portrait medals, one on each side of two lancet windows that puncture adjacent walls of the chapel. The paintings are based on four of Pisanello's medals. Um, four men are depicted, uh, each alive at the onset of the campaign to fresco the chapel. Pisanello made two small medals of Sigismondo Malatesta of Rimini uh, prior to 1441, uh, one um, of which is the source for the depiction of Sigismondo in the chapel. Um, which one it is is debated. And I should also say that it's actually not the representation of Sigismondo that's in this, uh, this particular image. <laughs> uh, but uh, facing him is Niccolo uh, Piccinino, uh, and that is the medal that seems to have been used as the source for the frescoed image. The embrasure of walls uh, flanking the other window bear depictions of John VIII Paleoglis and Leonello d'Este. And I encourage you to examine the latter two medals, that is the ones on the right-hand side of the slide uh, downstairs. Uh, the chapel uses, the, uses numismatic imagery to promote the protection of Constantinople from Ottoman invasion, a concern that was very real at the time. Badile painted the images in the years following Pope Eugenius IV's attempt to reconcile the Latin and Greek churches under papal authority and to launch a crusade to safeguard the Eastern Empire, which were both central issues addressed uh, at the Council of Ferrara, which was held uh, uh, around that time in the 1430s, late 1430s. Uh, full confirmation of the decree of union signed by, emperor, by the emperor in 1439 was only ratified in Constantinople um, about a decade or so later, um, although the next year the city fell to the Ottomans, causing the union to disintegrate. As Tanya Jones has demonstrated, each of the Italians represented in the chapel had a vested ideological, ideological interest in reacting uh, to uh, Eugenius IV's call for a crusade. While imparting a political message was key to the iconographic function of the frescoed medals, the, Im the painted images also thematize uh, the commemorative function of medals. In that sense, the frescoes form an um, obeisance to the medal itself. Large representations of a small object, the painted images attest to the high esteem uh, held for the potency of uh, medals. So, uh, on to the last section. Uh, Rimini, fusing patron, uh, metal, and building. Um, issues of commemoration, as we will see, uh, were, uh, are key to thinking about Sigismondo Malatesta's use of medallic imagery and medals, including portrait medals, several examples of what you see uh, on the screen, and all of these are by Matteo uh, De Pasti. Um, as is well known, a desire for medals first was inculcated in the courts of the Deste at Ferrara, the Aragon in Naples, and the Melatesta uh, in Rimini. The first humanistic treatise on warfare, De Re Militare, composed uh, around uh, 1455, was dedica dedicated to Sigismondo, appropriately given his role as a condottiere of renown. Working within an orbit of shifting alliances uh, and allegiances, Sigismondo headed the papal army. He later was aligned with the Sforza Duke of Milan. He fought for and against Alfonso V of Naples, and the Venetians also solicited his aid. Having debuted successfully in battle against a relative, who was Lord of Pesaro, while in his teens, Sigismondo shortly thereafter became uh, Lord of Rimini. At Rimini, he uh, cultivated um, an elite humanist court, attracting scholars such as Leon Battista Alberti. A marble portrait medallion by Agostino di Duccio um, of the Emperor Augustus, intended to be placed in the Chapel of the Liberal Arts in the Tempio Malatestiano, reveals Sigismondo's um, aspiration to actively evoke Rimini's Roman origins and to compare Augustus's building projects to his own ones. Toward the end of his life, Sigismondo, perhaps due to personal acts and aggression, ran afoul of the papacy, which was then seeking to reclaim authority over the papal states. 
On charges of blasphemy, idolatry, simony, and tyranny, Pope Pius II excommunicated Sigismundo in 1462, and his effigy was set on fire in front of St. Peter's. His territories crumbled uh, following various invasions, leaving him with only Rimini and a small territory around it at his death. Given his colorful uh, life and desire to spread word of his prowess, it is not surprising that Sigismondo quickly apprehended the importance of metals. The art historian Joanna Woods Marsden has argued that Sigismondo was the first to exploit the reverse of metals, um, the reverse of the metal for politically motivated purposes. Early on, he commissioned two medals from Pisanello, which show him, uh, that is, uh, uh, Sigismondo, ready to fight or actively engaged in combat. He would later have the Veronese goldsmith and architect uh, Matteo de Pasti create some 30 more medals, including the first portrait medal to depict a building on its reverse. While he commissioned a number of medals, among his favorite was one crafted in 1446 by uh, Matteo de Pasti. Um, the reverse of the medal depicts Sigismundo's recently realized castle with multiple towers and an imposing fortification wall, all heavily crenellated. Just as the more obscure imprese found on medals were surrogates of the sitters, meant to evoke and immortalize personal virtues, I would like to drill down on the idea that the depiction of Sigismundo's castle itself is a quasi-portrait, uh, a substitute for him. After Sigismondo secured papal permission to build the castle, its first stone was placed in 1437. The structure was uh, praised for its beauty, pulchritude, uh, as well as its impressive fortification. Um, suggesting a parallel between body and building, Sigismondo named the crenellated structure eponymously. It was referred to as Castel Sismondo. When the edifice was under construction, Sigismondo had a, held a contest uh, for a solemn poem commemorating both castle and its patron. A celebrated Lat a Latinist ultimately won, it seems, and his poem was chiseled into the facade of the stone edifice. In it, army commander and building were seen as analogs. The now lost inscription read, quote, Sismundo is my name, Sigismondo is my author. It was fairly radical for a 15th century Italian to promote himself through an outright dedication of a building to himself, although such a move uh, invoked uh, classical tradition, and Sigismondo's action had a couple of precedents uh, at the time, immediate precedents. One can be found at, uh, in the court of the Gonzaga in Mantua. As a letter written to Ludovico Gonzaga stated, quote, the castle in Mantua is the person of your lordship. It was common uh, for fortifications to be named after saints um, or else nearby city gates, but to explicitly signal bodily authority through a building was a very different operation. The portrait of the condottieri in the building were likened uh, through the medium of the metal, both in the sense that they were shown as counter images to one another on the metal, but also in that the metal united, um, buried, uh, no, united a buried uh, representation um, to Sigismondo's actual body, um, and uh, thus uh, suturing together person, metal, and also edifice. Within the main hall of the castle, um, excuse me, when the main hall of the castle was renovated in 1983, 24 bronze portrait medals were found to have been evenly distributed uh, in the wall at a height of about three meters. The images that you see are a plan of the room, so on the uh, left-hand side, um, and then a diagram showing the relative position of the medals in relation to one another when they were unearthed. The medals were grouped in eight batches of three, with one large medal um, of the castle along with two other smaller medals uh, with a Malatesta helmet. Sigismundo's portrait was uh, facing up in all of the cavities uh, except for one. As an aside, Sigismundo seems to have been quite taken with the practice of bearing medals for symbolic reasons. Uh, an additional 175 medals have been uncovered in other buildings commissioned by Sigismundo. Um, I will focus on one of those cases momentarily as I wrap up. Um, perhaps uh, the very personal association between building and person explains the frescoed image of Castel Sismondo in the Condottieri's funeral chapel in the Tempio Malatest uh, Malatestiano. 
While the depiction of the building on the medal and in the tondo probably meant to evoke uh, the metal, metal object uh, with its shape, um, while they differ slightly, uh, they both deploy the same uh, strategy of making the building appear taller than uh, it was. More importantly, however, the fresco announces uh, the absence of a metal, evoking uh, it both in, uh, in as well as uh, the absence of the Malatesta ruler. Um, another building uh, connected to Sismundo uh, in several ways, uh, but emphatically through metals, is the Tempio Malatestiano itself. Since the 13th century, the Malatesta had used the Franciscan church as their site for burial. The Jubilee of 1450 presumably encouraged uh, Sigismondo to rebuild the church based on a design provided by Leon Battista Alberti. Charles Hope has argued that at that juncture, Sigismondo elected to commission a well-known uh, medal celebrating the building from Matteo de Pasti. In the late uh, summer of, of 1756, uh, Sigismondo's grave was opened. Six specimens of uh, Matteo de Pasti's medal bearing a depiction of the unrealized elevation of the Tempio were found underneath the condottiere's body, aligned in the shape of a cross with four placed under his spine and one underneath uh, each shoulder. And I think that you can see the medal kind of popping out, peeking out uh, underneath uh, the body of Sigismondo. Deposits were also found elsewhere in the building during the rest restoration campaign uh, that was undertaken after World War II. These included a deposit of eight medals, including four large portrait medals of Castel Sismondo uh, that were found on top of a uh, plaster in the building. Um, it seems that while the burial uh, medals operated uh, as apotropaic devices, there's also something seductive about the notion that while hidden from view, uh, they suggested the presence of Sigismondo um, in ways past and present, uh, namely in the reverse portrait of Sigismondo, the large-scale representation of the castle on the reverse of Matteo di Pasti's medal, thus really uh, uniting, I think, um, both Sigismondo uh, and the medal kind of through the frescoed image that you see. Um, so, uh, to conclude, uh, scrutinizing uh, issues of scale allows us to pause to consider terms like miniature and monumental. Within discussions of scale uh, in humanities scholarship, a commonly invoked figure is the contemporary poet and scholar Susan Stort. Stort has theorized that the miniature and the gigantic as modalities um, in which the miniature is a metaphor for the interiority of the subject and the monumental is a means of understanding, quote, the abstract authority of the state and collective public life, or exteriority. Whereas the former indicates a reduction in scale that equated viewing uh, with, a, with an act of possession, encountering the monumental engenders a sense of being possessed. Stuart's observations help us to understand how shifts in scale create critical distinctions between the private uh, and the public as coins and medals were enlarged. While medals and coins were objects that uh, provoke a sense of interior moral qualities, particularly virtue, scaled up the exteriorization of such objects created the public persona. The cases I have considered this evening also each point to a much less stable sense of hierarchy between major and minor in the arts than we might expect. Metals mixed uh, into the identity um, of other objects, both in terms of iconography and, as we saw with the portraits of Filarete and Bendinelli, uh, the first objects that we looked at, um, as literal objects. Such instances call into question the conventional desire to, divor to divorce media from one another in ways that run counter to medieval and Renaissance aesthetics that prided mixture and veritas um, as a source of pleasure and admiration. During the Renaissance, the technical arts, or what are sometimes called uh, the minor arts, in our case metal making, merged with the monumental arts, specifically, specifically through architectural ornamentation, in an expanded field um, that was also hybrid and in which practices bled into one another. This occurred on a representational level 
but also on a structural one, wherein discourses seemingly anchored in one arena migrated or infiltrated other areas of art making. I hope tonight to have countered object isolationism. In other words, a dynamic that favors seeing the facture of sculpture, painting, and architecture at various scales as distinct activities, and which tends to create an ahistorical hierarchy in which the major arts are utterly distinct from the minor ones. Thank you.